Thanks for joining us again this week for another episode of Wide Open Throttle. This week we have with us Greg Emerson from European Car. And Greg, I want to start this week's discussion topics by talking with you about your recent head-to-head -head episode. You put an FRS against a GTI and an E30 M3. So I first want to ask you, how did you choose your contenders? Well, obviously we're, we're the last people to the party with the FRS comparison test. So um, we, we didn't want to do the obvious test and also the argument in the office was why, why doesn't Europe build one? Uh, so we looked at what was out there and really the closest we could get was a 128i BMW, which is... But the price is... Yeah, 31,000, so it's not even close. The argument brought us around to, well, you know, the E30 M3 was where it all began. This is, this is the car we should use. So we got that, but then we felt, well, it's a bit retro. We'll bring a GTI, it's similar money. It's probably what most of the entry level enthusiast guys are driving in our market. So this is more of a direct head-to-head. -head. So if you've got a GTI, should you sell it and buy an FRS or vice versa, maybe? That's one of those classic things that, that any enthusiast goes through. I've got, yeah. in this case, you know, tw maybe 25 grand to spend. What do I buy? And the car industry too often tends to think that people cross shop logically. No, no, one, no, 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 no one would imagine that you might look at an FRS or maybe a, a, an early M3. But, you know, if you're an enthusiast, you want a driving car. If you can find a good M3 for the money, yeah, absolutely. So, so where that's did you a question. Yeah. yeah, if we have 25 grand, do we go new or used? <laughs> I mean, so much of it depends on your loyalties. The the E30 M3 was was spectacular. I mean, it's it's you know it, it's like going to church for most of us. It's it's one of those very special cars let me, that. Let me butt in. I mean, uh, how much horsepower? Yeah. <laughs> how, much, how much horsepower does that M3 make? Well, I mean, yeah, it's not. How, a no, 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 no. But no, no, as a it's 200, right? It's 200. Yeah. yeah. How much horsepower does the FRS make? So honestly, I mean, the, the, the new car versus the almost 30 year old, like. But you're also dealing with a, I mean, what was a $35,000 car? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, these definitely aren't apples and apples. This, this is, right, right, these right. are very different cars, but. I'm trying to get you to say something nice about a Toyota. So. I, I, I'll never get sucked into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what I think was really interesting is, is we had Mike Febo with us, who, who was aware of the test you guys have done. And I guess Randy Pope's driving an FRS managed to get around the streets a second quicker in an FRS than a GTI. Well, in the hands of mortals, the GTI is a much quicker car. So all our times are about a second quicker in a GTI than an FRS, which I think made a good point for us is that, you know, to, to really get the most out of the FRS, you've got to start switching stuff off. And then we watch guys spinning. It's not surprising, yeah, I mean, you know, the FRS, it's harder to explore the limits for like a mere mortal. Like a race car driver, it's like that. But a GTI, yeah, it's easier for us to get in and be like, wow, it's, you know, explore the limits of understeer as opposed to oversteer. But our point, and, and you know, Mike was making the, the, the fact that, you know, the, the FRS was a much more entertaining car, but we were on a racetrack. I mean, the point I was trying to make was, we were originally gonna do it in the canyons, um, where, you know, let's say it's raining, you live up north, you need to get to your friend's house, you're in a hurry, you want to have some fun, you start switching off buttons. One car's going to get you there, the other car you may or may well, not. Hang on now. Let's say you have the FRS or the E30 M3 and it's raining in the canyons. Well, you don't even have the option of switching off traction. Right. Like that, so I would you know. think the FRS would be the safer way to go, right? Potentially, as a newer car, but what we found, <laughs> what we found on the track I'm not, I'm not ever going to give in to this. Um, what we found on the track is that the M3 is so neutral yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, was, it was by far the safest handling. I'm not, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not saying any of these no, cars I, are I dangerous, you but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, once we start turning things off, we're doing that in a very extreme situation yeah. uh, under controlled conditions with expert drivers, etc. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Since these cars are aimed at young drivers who don't necessarily have racetracks, don't necessarily have experience, what would I rather put my kid in? Yeah, I'd put them in a GTI and they'll get there quicker yeah. and uh, they'll get there. All right, now I want to move to a discussion of the entry luxury market. Scion recently announced it wants to move up market. Mazda's thrown its hat in the ring, but we've got, you know, Mercedes with the CLA. We've got Audi's A3 sedan. Is this segment getting crowded? Well, two things. So two-parter, I should say. One, yes, it's getting crowded, but also Scion moving up market? Like, that that's... what. That doesn't make sense. Why would you, you, you develop this youth entry level brand to feed teenagers into the Toyota mill to eventually get them into the Lexus expensive stuff when they're old? Why would you take it up market? It doesn't even make sense. It means that the original strategy, which was very cleverly designed to sell 
obsolete Japanese domestic market vehicles to American consumers under another badge isn't working anymore. The other point is that, you know, everyone wants to play in the luxury brand. Everyone likes to think of themselves as a luxury brand because no one ever wants to be like mainstream. And yeah, you know, but is the entry it's, luxury it's, becoming mainstream? Of course it is. Well, I'd argue luxury is becoming mainstream. When you, as we've said before on this program, when you can buy a Mercedes-Benz CLA for the same money as a, a well-equipped Ford Fusion, then traditional luxury is heading into the mainstream. And that trend is going to continue. The problem for people like the Scions and the Acuras and the Infinities and so on is, well, how do we, with, with BMW and and Audi and Mercedes coming down, how do we move up to separate ourselves? You know, it's a pyramid, it's getting awfully crowded up the top if everyone wants to be there. Can you just say you're luxury and be luxury? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> wow. Well, like, what constitutes luxury? Well, look, at, look at the um, Acura, the ILX, which is our generation's Cimarron. Yeah. Right? That's a Honda Civic with a badge. That's all that is. You know? And it's not doing well. It's doing horrible. Yeah. Why, why would you buy that? Yeah. You know? So like Honda that Civic's not that bad a car. No, it is. It's a really good car. Yeah, it's a good car. The but when you get to ILX, girl who's not a trust fund baby. I think you have people going to the showroom, and I think maybe they, they know it's a Civic. You know, deep down, they're like, God, this thing's thirty or thirty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that's just that's too much for a two-liter, one hundred and forty horsepower yeah, car. And I do have a problem with someone saying, "Well, we're just going to put a car out. We'll do this styling. We'll add this sorts of features. You know, tick the box, tick the box, tick the box, and we'll say it's the new luxury." And it's, it's going to be the luxury car for people who don't buy the conventional luxury cars. Well, I think the point is you need some, you need some tradition. I mean, don't yeah. you, you need some reason to say why, why it's luxury. But for Scion, I think there, there is actually hope with this in that, you know, with FRS, they've, they've seen good results. You know, this is a 25, close to $30,000 car sometimes. And they're selling, like everyone they can build. Right. And in Japan, there are like rear drive, you know, sports sedans that Toyota builds that they don't bring here. So right. if they bring something like that over, and hey, here's a $30,000, 200 plus horsepower rear drive, which is much different from a Toyota, you know, or even say like an IS, then, you know, it could work. Well, well why don't they say, instead of being a luxury brand, Scion's gonna be the sport brand. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what they should, should do. The, you know, that right. way you can bring in those and that's cars. Also and youth, it should be, right? sport yeah, is youth. It, it, and yeah. it should be affordable. Right. It should be affordable. The FRS and the BRZ have proven that there is a market for a rear drive sporty car under thirty thousand dollars. But I would I would say this. So okay, the entry level luxury, right? Like you know, Mini was kind of the first success for entry. But are Minis like is that actually luxury or is it just I don't like the price luxury. is luxury? The price yeah, well, is it even luxury? It's just kind of expensive. <laughs> no, but it's, it's it, they're selling something that's a design. Yeah. It's it's just a nice piece of design, a nice thing yeah. to have. It's got mass customization. You know, hardly yeah. any two minis are the same, yeah. which is a, a really important piece. You know, if and I was Scion, it's, it's really, it's to really that rare. Was, that was their original yeah. plan was you could customize, no one does it, but you could customize your no, Scion. No, because, the because if, you look at, if you look at what Mini's done, which is a, a, an absolute case study, the only people who do mass customization better than Mini are Porsche. Right. And Scion isn't even in the same league. And if they were smart with the cars, the cars looked great and great design. Doesn't matter which end they're driven, I think right. people would buy them. So, but then I guess so. Then what? What is like actual luxury? I mean, it's just does the word even have meaning anymore? Well, with Kia, for example, I'm really impressed by Kia because I feel like they offer a lot of luxury amenities on supremely inexpensive vehicles, where you have steering wheel controls but, on like but, a fourteen thousand dollar car. Or is that well, that's the thing. What is constitutes the luxury I mean, segment? Because yeah. you would think ergonomic amenities are that is what constitutes part of the luxury aspect of it. I think. I think luxury now has become, um, it's all become on how you can communicate what your brand represents. And if people believe your brand is luxury, therefore it is. And there are some, in the car industry, there are some that are because of um, their history. So Mercedes-Benz has been building premium cars since they built the first one, pretty much. If you look at Audi, which is an interesting case study, I mean, you know, they were, 30 they years were the ago. Volvo, right? They were bashing the, case cars for weirdos. And now <laughs> Audi is, is a luxury brand, but yeah. they've built it. It's been a 30 year program to bring Audi up to the level where it could compete with in technology and driving dynamics in design with the likes of Mercedes Benz and BMW. And they do, successfully. Yeah. They yeah. do, but it's a 30 year program. Yeah. Cadillac is another one. Cadillac used to build these cars. I think the problem is for someone like an Acura or a, is how do you make that leap now? How do you convince people that your 
product is luxury? What is going to convince them that it's worth paying extra money for? Right. Where is the prestige? All right, so I want to move now to a discussion of our electric car manufacturers. Tesla recently announced they're actually going to turn a profit here, yet Fisker looks like it's ready to pack it in. So what's the difference? The Tesla was a complete, um, well-engineered, well-designed uh, vehicle, pure electric. The Fisker had some real issues. It had some issues with the way it was built and the, the powertrain scenario didn't work as well. Launching a new car company is, is, is an old joke, you know, if, how do you make a small fortune? Start with a large one and launch a car company. It is an incredibly, it's yeah. an incredibly difficult thing to do and you know Tesla's not out of the woods yet. There's a lot more that can still happen there. The, the company is producing basically one model. Um, it needs more volume, it needs more uh, at least another two or three models to actually become a full-line automaker. Tesla was quite clever in, in starting with a Lotus. You know, you're, so much of your work is done in, in you know, where the, the chassis is put together, you're adding weight, you're dealing with issues, but, um, you know, they started from a very good foundation. I'd still argue that long term, you're actually better off buying the original Elise. Detroit Electric now announced they're going to create this $135,000 sports car. It's what do they need to do weird. now, though, to differentiate themselves from Tesla and to succeed within this market? They need to come out with a uh, consumer commuter car. You know what I mean? You need to have that product that everybody wants to differentiate themselves from Tesla, who's selling, for all intents and purposes, a mm -hmm. $100,000 car. I think their price point's crazy though, 135,000. Well, the, the who's Roadster. Buy that car? Well, the Roadster was 110. You can't launch a business with a 10 grand electric car. Right, right. You, know, you have to start at the top, try and build your business, and and Tesla's managed to ride that that wave and survive. It, they it also, have, Tesla also, off. they they went out and hired the best chassis guy in the business. They hired like the best programmers in the business, the best software guys. You know, so the, the and and look, Elon Musk had a billion dollars. And then he borrowed five hundred million dollars, and so they they spent a lot of money making this thing. I don't, yeah, I don't know with Detroit. I don't, I don't know enough about the business plan. It's an interesting brand, though, because it does go back to the very beginning of the automobile, um, and so I don't know what, I don't know whether there's any value in that, Ron. I, I just, who's I mean, going to care? I don't know much about the history, so for me, <laughs> there's no value. But yeah, I mean. <laughs> You know, low volume electric sports car. I mean, there's some appeal there. You know, sure. Yeah. Handles, Especially because the Roadster, Tesla yeah. stopped making the Roadster. They did sell like 2,000 of them. So yeah. So, a market. Am I going to buy it over a 911 Crest? No. Probably not. But, <laughs> or a but I might <laughs> add it to my stable, you know. If yes. I want an electric car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do we think these companies are going to survive BMW? The i When the i brand comes, you've yeah. got an i8, mm -hmm. you've got i3 i3 you've I got a tesla huge does. backup but I th I they go tesla. to dealership you can go to any bmw yeah. dealership they're all around the world they got warranties i think tesla does because of the quality of that product that, that is very like, like i said in the video i did on the, the tesla and the citroen like everybody who's driven the model s gave it some kind of major award you know it's, it's that good it's but that. Is, is that not the novelty factor i mean no, 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 no. It's at actually all. no. It's actually it is actually a good car. But your point is absolutely valid because BMW moving into the i cars is a very um, is a sign that you know once once they start to sense that the cost of entry in terms of the technology and the i's are a hybrid type vehicle anyway. Once the technology uh, cost comes down and once customer acceptance starts to go up, everybody will be in there. Right. And and so for someone like Detroit Electric, how do they cut through? I think it's going to be a real struggle. To start from zero now, that, that, that's a, that's a right. And there's no, there's no, there's like no, you know, Bond villain billionaire behind Detroit Electric. Tesla has that, you know. You never know. There might be an Elon Musk doppelganger who comes forth and heads up Detroit Electric. Could happen. Sure. Or something else. Cheers. 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 Good episode. This doesn't count. <laughs>